Yes, welcome. This is F a Rap Critic. I'm your boy Malik16, founder and creator of F a Rap Critic, which is part of Plates and Crates, which I also founded, as well as the Rap Ruler, which I've also founded. And no, these are not Christmas colors. I know, I know it's December, I know it's close to that time, but I am nowhere near that festive. It is in fact something much doper and just to make you understand that the seriousness of this drip I'm going to stand up and model a little bit so you understand you know we're talking about that walker wear RBG sweatsuit and um you know walker wear being one of the pioneering hip-hop fashion brands of the 90s is just such a big deal it's classic shout out to April and Cole shout out to the whole walker wear and uh, that's what we do on this channel. We promote dope brands when we are not busy promoting our own brand, which, you know, by the way, that I used to love her t-shirt is still very much alive and popping in the sense of modeling, you know, might as well. There you go. I used to love her. But yeah, that's what we do. And uh, since we're talking about classics and classics are what we specialize in on this channel and on the ratruler.com, it's only right that we take a deep dive into yet another album that turned 25 this year. And we're talking about none other than Busta Rhymes' When Disaster Strikes. Now we'll get right into it right after you take a minute to like and subscribe to the channel. We'll go right into category one, where we go over the album, the product itself. A little background on this particular LP. It was released in September of 1997, and it is the sophomore album from Busta Rhymes, making it his second studio release as a solo performer. And with no further ado, we jump into the first dimension of category one, quality of production. So one thing you're gonna quickly find from the first three songs and the intro of this album is that DJ Scratch is Busta Rhymes' go-to producer, and at this time, DJ Scratch was also the DJ for the newly reunited EPMD, making him one of hip hop's best kept secrets of the 90s because he was providing undeniable boom bap hip hop production that was sorely underrated, but it was a sound that a lot of people were familiar with. He also would contribute to Onyx and a few other New York rap acts. But here, you're gonna hear his signature elements and we'll get into that as soon as I name the other producers that you'll find on this album. Another New York staple name, Easy Mo B, even though he's produced coast to coast, but most associated with New York for some reason. Uh, master of using horns, blaring sounds, and just a lot of jazzy instrumentation. Here, he provides one of the darker tracks on there, uh, Things We Do For Money or Things We Be Doing For Money. And it's just an interesting space to see him in. On the flip side, you get a seldom mentioned New York name from someone who's making a transition from straight rapper to rapper producer. And we're talking about Agala, formerly known as Adolf the Assassin. And he provides the sequel track to Things We Be Doing For Money. You also hear from producers whose names started buzzing because of this album, like Rashad Smith, Shamelo, and Buddha, who are responsible for the album's main singles. Now you also get production from Rockwilder and Busta Rhymes on the boards himself, and almost as if it was in response to our last episode, P. Diddy on production, known still as Puff Daddy at the time, and then last but not least, of course, you get production from the Uma, but we all know that it was mostly Jay Dillon. So a wide range of producers, a smorgasbord of production, a very active and lively soundscape that's giving you diverse sounds. So back to the points about DJ Scratch. DJ Scratch is helming most of the beats on here and is responsible for not only the dark beats but some of the lighter beats so for every track like the title track when disaster strikes you're gonna get a track like get high tonight which is a simple production with some notes that just make it a bouncy beat and so one of the signature sounds of dj scratch's production is that you're going to hear these blaring siren type horns that he likes to line up in rapid succession to create this kind of emergency alarm kind of feeling to again let you know that this is lively production to keep you awake and really 
shock the senses. They're so smoothly woven into the beats that they're not the main thing that you notice. They're just there and they keep it lively. He also uses similar guitar licks, organ sounds, and simple muted bass lines. But the bass lines are probably the most Busta Rhymes thing on here because it allows him to ride the bass more than anything else. The drums are always going to be clack, boom bap sounding when it comes to DJ Scratch's production. And so DJ Scratch, who a lot of you may know now from hosting the DJ battle segments of the Versus competitions when, when they were just popping all over, um, he becomes the anchor of this album production wise. So when you need to go back to the Busta Rhymes core sounding stuff, that's where his tracks are littered in between. And he starts the album off very strong with three songs, three beats that showcase the tone of where he's trying to take you before he starts showing you his other sides. So let, let's talk about the unlikely pairings because we already talked about Agala and Easy Mo B giving you two of the darkest offerings on this album and two different flavors of such. So the sequel gives you a, a different rhythm and, and, and melody pattern than what the first one does. So it's only a continuation in name and what the rappers are doing on the song. But in beat, the only similarity is that they're both darker beats. Where it gets unconventional is on the Rashad Smith contributions here, where you get the most electro and out of the box production in the form of Rhymes Galore and Dangerous. Now, neither of these are reinventing the wheel because they do happen to be rip samples. The first, Rhymes Galore, being just a really electrified version of Rufus Thomas's Do the Funky Penguin, which we also heard was a sample two years later on Ghostface's Supreme Clientel, just as is, just for the breakbeat, the classic hip hop staple breakbeat that it was. What Rashad Smith did to it was try to make it his own with this distorted replaying of it which gave it a different feel. So instead of dun -dun -dun -dun, it's dun -dun 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 on the lower end with that kind of vibrating feel to it. Dangerous is a rip from an 80s dance tune, which is kind of spacey and campy, a novelty track called the E.T. Boogie, a nod to the, the movie, which at that time was one of the most popular movies of all time, E.T. the Extraterrestrial. And Buster is going on to explain that he got the hook from an old 1980s PSA about drugs. This is serious. And he turned it into this is serious. So he's feeding off of what the producers give him. And because of that, you're getting a showcase here. On the flip side, Rockwilder, who was building his name for being the go-to electro beat sky, because in the next two years, he would give us the track named after him, the Rockwilder by Red and Meth takes a decidedly toned down path and contributes to track one, which is a sample of Stevie Wonder's Loves and Need a Love Today, and it's the smoothest track on the album. Speaking of big samples, Busta Rhymes, when he's behind the board, he does the biggest direct sample rips a la Puff Daddy and company, and what was popular at the time, doing big, popular 70s and 80s songs, sample rips that are immediately recognizable. In this case, he's sampling Last Night a DJ Saved My Life for Ain't a Problem a Squad Can't Fix, and also Turn It Up where he samples Al Green's Love and Happiness in probably the simplest way. He just slows down the BPM and just takes the tail end where that horn started. I know this well because I've sampled two Al Green songs back in my days where I tried my hand at production and it turned out being the backdrops for two of my most popular songs when I performed. So shout out to Buster for having that ear because no one has touched that Al Green sample before or since. Surprisingly, Diddy's production on here is the track that is not a blatant sample. The only thing that can be said about the song Body Rock is that it is almost identical to the song The Business by De La Soul, which appeared on their album the year before, Stakes Is High. And because I, you know, if you remember in the De La Soul episode where we reviewed Stakes Is High, because I branded De La as being the leaders of this underground versus mainstream movement, part of me feels like this 
beat and song was in response to the business since they had taken such a decided stance against the jigginess that was going on and since puffy and mace represented that and buster was closely associated you know buster being in the middle of both of those camps right it, the old leaders of the new school buster rhymes came from native tongue stock but the new buster rhymes was touching bad boy level fame and he was in between and i don't know why this song was a go because not only do the patterns not only does the simple note structure sound just like the business it sounds like they actually took the notes from the business and reordered them but kept the same pacing so it's boom 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 it, it really just sounds like a slow down version of the business. I, I can't even put my finger on how it's differentiated. The only real distinguishing component of this beat is the swirly electric guitar riff that comes in and out every few bars. And it really just sounds like a chopped and screwed version of the business. <laughs> and you know, they're being extra flossy on this track. So really interesting stuff. Uh, when it comes to what Diddy did here, what Rockwilder did. And then, of course, the standout track of all time being Put Your Hands Where My Eyes Could See, courtesy of Shamelo, Buddha, and Busta Rhymes himself, which is a sample from Sills and Croft. And when you hear the sample, you realize that this wasn't as intricate of a production masterpiece as everyone at the time were claiming it to be. When, when this song came out in 1997, people were wondering where they got this beat from. Where's this beat from? Where is it from? And then you hear the sample and it really is just a slow down version of the sample for the lead in. So all of these things are something to consider on a scale from one to five part beats when you're talking about the quality of the production that takes us directly into dimension two, the cohesiveness of the sonic bed. Now this album was laid out in a way where you could tell there was an intentional uh, crafting to make sure the vibe shifted when they needed to. So I mentioned DJ Scratch's first three songs being, you know, pretty dark and trying to set the tone of disaster striking. And, and so the Uma production is the bridge right before you go into the more bouncy stuff. So Hardcore, despite the title, is not the most hardcore track on this album. It's actually one of the most simplified and playful, and it gets you ready for the more commercial style tracks like Get High Tonight, which is followed by Turn It Up, which is followed by Put Your Hands Where My Eyes Can See, which is followed by In A Problem My Squad Can't Fix. Then we get the second movement of darker tracks, which is started off by We Can Take It Outside, followed by Rhymes Galore, which is somewhere in the middle. And then The Things We Be Doing For Money, parts one and two. Then you get the second wave of the softer tracks led off by One Dangerous, and then the body rock before rounding it all out with the darkness again, which is get off my block and the dramatic outro. So there's intentional sequencing going on, which is all you can ever ask for an album to be intentional when they're thinking about what songs should follow or precede each other. So one thing that's interesting is with DJ Scratch being the anchor and setting the tone with mild beats, dark beats and lighter beats, everyone is able to match to this connecting nucleus so and you're going to get your rashad smiths your buster rhymes and your p diddy production it's going to match in the tone with the lighter production that scratch gives and when you get your darker offerings from easy Moby and agala it's going to go right in line with some of those darker beats that TJ Scratch laid the foundation for so when you get the things we'd be doing for money it goes right in the same vein with We Can Take It Outside, which is this brilliant Henry Mancini sample and one of the most standout beats of that whole entire album. And so a track like One is, is the smoothest and has its own lane, but nothing here sounds out of alignment with the rest of the album. Amazingly, with that many producers, that many new sounds, because even though Shamelo Buddha and Busta gave us this sample beat for Put Your Hands Where Your Eyes Can See, we hadn't heard a mainstream song with that kind of pattern before. So it's there's a genius quality to how you sample. We say it all the time. 
another thing that happens is that because DJ Scratch has that signature bounce and bass to his drums, uh, what the Uma does, again, more specifically Jay Dilla does on a song so hardcore, it matches that same dynamic where coming from all the DJ Scratch songs, as soon as you go into so hardcore, it doesn't sound like a deviation, it sounds like a perfect blend because it's from that same ilk of, okay, here's this bouncy pattern and here's these bouncy bass and drum matches to make Buster do his thing because it's a very open beat. Speaking of blend, the first two songs go perfectly into each other. By the time the whole world looking at me ends with that did -in -did -in -did -in sound, you go right into Survival Hungry with a ticking metronome that leads it in as the perfect bridge between the two. Again, you're getting really simple patterns that work for someone like Buster Rhymes because it allows him to bring his dynamism, which he does. On some versions of the album, the Turn It Up song goes from the Al Green sample to the Knight Rider sample, which is a classic 80s show about a talking artificial intelligence crime fighting car and its owner. Yeah, and we'll talk more about that as we go. But yeah, all of the production here because the nucleus of DJ Scratch matches up to some other pairing on the album. And I think we talked about those kind of situations when we went over the Raz Cast album and my guest Artemis, shout out to Artemis, talked about pairings on an album where you get two light songs that show up in different places but complement each other. You get two dark songs that show up in different places on the album but complement each other. And that's the whole premise there. Something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats that takes us directly into dimension three. We talk about the intentional mood and tone on this album. So what is the mood and tone on this album? Let's see. This is Buster Rhymes' second outing as a solo artist and he begins the album with a really, really uh, big intro. And, and it's a really dramatic intro, which is not unlike all of his albums. He leads them off all the same way with this impending sense of something big about to happen. Here, DJ Scratch and Buster provide the production backdrop for three different movements of the intro, where the first one has Lord of Mercy talking, as if he's making an announcement of this disaster coming in the form of Buster Rhymes. The second part is a beat that gets turned up and down as Dolomite speaks. And then the third is this bubbling bass line intro with just echoes and split star yelling until Buster comes in and starts yelling himself. And all of this is delivered in a way of, this is something big happening. Here's the introduction, here's something big coming, be prepared, get ready. Now the first song, The Whole World Looking At Me, in title alone, and, and in some of the ad-libs, Buster is speaking to the idea that his first album was a success, and now there's this audience expectation, there's this industry expectation, the whole world is looking at him. Not with pressure though, he doesn't really indicate pressure on the song. He's more speaking about anticipation, like what is next? You know, in the ad libs, he's like, I feel so imperial. He's just bragging on that song. He doesn't really uh, go into any analysis of what the whole world looking at me means, but because that is the first song on the album, you get the idea that he's like, okay, people want to know what I'm coming with, here's what I'm coming with. And that's pretty much it. That's pretty much as thematic as the album goes. You don't get any skits that uh, speak to the idea of a disaster coming. You get the outro where Busta Rhymes famously doing what he did throughout his 90s album, speaking about this oncoming shift that would happen in 2000, which was not uncommon amongst rappers who identified as being part of the 5% nation. There was this whole doom and gloom that the year 2000 was going to be the year that the Illuminati took over and or the motherships came back. It's just anybody who represents the nation of the gods and earths can correct me in the comments for sure. I'm always open to correction. In the last episode, 
I stated that there were no conscious rappers from Harlem. Someone pointed out Immortal Technique. So you were in fact 100% right on that. Shout out to Technique. I said I was the only closest thing to conscious rapper from Harlem, but shout out to Immortal Technique. So I'm always open to the feedback. Um, and that includes that hater in the comments of my Foxy Brown episode. So shout out to you. So anyway, yeah, that's about as far as the themes go. You get this grand opening and it's grand closing and in between it's all energy there's an upbeat keep the party going vibe throughout the album and an undeniable boom back feel so buster wants you to know that this is a big sounding album the bass lines are heavy and big on here the electric sounds are big and heavy on here but it's energetic more than anything else something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats when you're thinking about mood and tone Takes us to dimension four, song distinction versus repetition of words and sounds. Now we talked about the range of production, but it doesn't mean that we're without repetitive elements. DJ Scratch has his go-to production sounds, and because of that, in the tracks that he's responsible for, after a while you will feel a little familiarity going on. A lot of the bass lines sound similar on this album, but not in a way where it's the same bass melodies. You probably won't hear the same melody for any track on here. And so that gives the impression that every song sounds different from each other. Good job, right? Uh, rhyme wise, Busta Rhymes is not giving you a lot of variation when it comes to actual things said. In fact, you'll hear a few things on many songs. You're gonna hear him mention my whole squad. He's going to say my whole squad several times throughout this album. You're also going to hear bounce more times than I can count. And you're also going to hear word bond or word is bond and variations of that. Again, another byproduct of Busta Rhymes affiliation with the Nation of the Gods and Earths. And so, yeah, the repetition level is, is present on this album. I don't know if it's enough to take you out of the listening experience. It's probably something that you'd only notice if you were doing my job. Or it becomes one of those things you can't put your finger on when you're trying to identify why some songs or verses are not as memorable. Something to consider on the scale from one to five heartbeats. Dimension five, the amount of content versus the amount of songs. There are a lot of songs on this album. There are no less than 16 to 17 songs. And out of those, Busta doesn't make a lot of intentional strides towards hitting you with any particular message. You get tracks like One that are very focused on talking from the 5% teachings about relationships and it kind of stays where it's supposed to be in that vein. And then things we've been doing for money, you can tell Busta is trying to go somewhere and he slips in some messaging in that story. But for the most part, it is Busta doing this Busta thing. We're talking braggadocio and energy all throughout. Something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats. It takes us to Dementia Six, the features. There's a lot of them on this album. This was the era of people gathering features and being excited to see an album, to see who was on it. And Busta does not give you any shortage of features. So first and foremost, you get Jamal from Death Squad, continuing that connection. You also get Dolomite, as I mentioned on the intro. Anthony Hamilton, before the game knew his name on the things we'd be doing for money part two, giving us the background vocals and that dramatic lead out uh, introducing the world to his voice that we would hear him appear on a bunch of hip-hop tracks from that point forward before we got to really know him as a household name. Speaking of singers, we also had Erica Badu is probably the most surprising feature on this whole entire album. Uh, she was a really hot commodity this year and Busta scooped up and not only did she sing but she had a short little rap verse on there as well showcasing her range and her ambidextrous nature that we would come to know after that year. Now, fresh off of our Mace episode, not only does P. Diddy produce the track Body Rock, him and Mace are featured as rappers alongside Rampage, who is Busta's family, 
and also a member of Flip Mode Squad. So it would behoove me to mention that this album introduces you to the Flip Mode Squad. You may have heard Busta mention Flip Mode Squad on songs prior to this album and maybe on the last album, but this is your official introduction and that consisted of, at the time, Rampage the Last Boy Scout, who had made a name for himself already two and a half years prior, and by this point had his debut solo album. Lord Have Mercy, who was supposed to be the next up, he was supposed to be being primed to be the next standout member of Flip Mode Squad, but what happens is that you get the emergence of Rod Digger. Shout out to Digger. This track, although we had heard her before, if you're a true underground hip hop head, you might have heard her on some outsider songs, and of course, famously on the Fuji's The Score album, going back to back with Lauryn Hill on the song Cowboys. But this song is how the hip hop world really got to know Digger because she comes out and says one of the most controversial lyrics of the 90s. I can only imagine if we had Twitter back then. She says, burning MCs like Betty's Grants. And bear in mind, this was the same year this actually happened. Uh, really tragic incident. And it's not the only memorable or eye-popping line in her short verse. She's also one of the first female rappers to insinuate uh, having male gen genitalia being that much of a boss, being like, yeah, this is what happens. But she also shouts out the outsiders on that crew, which reminds me of what Eminem was doing when he first came out. Still repping that crew heavily, even while moving into a bigger and newer direction. And so Rod Digger becomes the standout, rounding out that flip mode squad introduction. Of course, you get Baby Sham, who was a member of a Queens crew called the Killer Kids at the time. So they were still putting out white label singles and repping their brand. And Busta Rhymes is right hand man, of course, Spliff Star, who uh, apparently had just started rapping uh, a few years before. And so this was his introduction as a rapper. And so you get this one person on this song who was introduced as a member of the Flip Mode Squad named Sirius. And he has a hate it or love it verse on this song, which uh, we'll discuss probably in the next dimension, but his name is Sirius and he went on to become a producer. Surprisingly enough, his most notable production happens with No Limit Records of all camps. Yeah, you're getting introduced to some characters on this album and Buster Rhymes shows up each time on those features to match. He doesn't slouch when the other rappers are on or the singers are on. He does his thing. Rampage appears on two other songs as well as the intro and Lord of Mercy appears on the final song with Busta Rhymes, Get Off My Block, uh, to round things out. So he's really trying to get you familiar with Flip Mode Squad and he makes no qualms about repping them and stating the name with intentional branding. Something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats. That takes us directly to Dimension 7. The question of, does the weakest song bring the album down or do the weakest songs bring the album down? Depending on how many weak songs you think exist here. It's always subjective, but because you have so many tracks here, the probability is higher to have songs that you skip. So if we're just going off of performance, right? then we have to take into consideration that we could take it outside. The, the serious verse got a lot of flack because his lead in, everything from his lead in to the voice, to the lines, to the way he delivered them, left a lot of people like, what is this? It was a really menacing, perfect beat for a posse cut. One of the darker tracks, one of the most thumping tracks that you really need a stereo system to appreciate and his decision to come in like nee, 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 nee. super size and talking about sweet potato pies for a minute you would almost think it was Busta Rhymes playing with his voice and taking on a character like we hear a lot of rappers do an alter ego type of character because his delivery is so similar to Busta the way he's making his voice uh, have that tremolo to it um, and but what he's doing with that nasally high pitch sound that had gone the way of the dinosaurs at that point and we hadn't heard anybody do that since like jesse west it's one of those acquired tastes like salt and vinegar chips you got these deep 
uh, intimidating voices like Lord of Mercy is on there. Even the woman rapper appearing on there has a deeper voice. So it really makes it stand out where you could think it's genius because of contrast to a deep commanding voice like Lord of Mercy is in this nasally high pitched voice series. It's like, oh great. And you had them juxtapose in a way where it like makes this parallel. But Sirius also adds an uneven number where everybody would have just had like two people to a verse, two people to a verse. This seven kind of carrying the uh, the legacy of the scenario remix makes it like, hmm, might bring it down for some people. And I remember hearing complaints and criticism of just his feature on that song when it came out. Maybe over the years that that's been uh, less of a blemish. Now, the other feature, Jamal, on Ain't a Problem My Squad Can't Fix, unfortunately, is one of the other candidates for weakest song on the album, just because not only is it already not a memorable track, because it's just last night a DJ saved my life with rappers on it, uh, there's nothing that Busta or Jamal do that stands out. Jamal being less of a dynamic character than Busta and less of a dynamic character than almost everybody else featured on this album, meaning that Rampage, The Last Boy Scout, and Diddy had more presence than Jamal. Jamal is just kind of like Keith Murray without the big words. There's no niche that he's really filling that required him to be on this song. And even him and Busta don't have crazy chemistry with their back and forth verse structure. So it becomes a track that I've never heard anybody talk about. It's a forgettable song, and part part of that is because of who's on it. You know, if this I'm thinking even if this was a single, as it could have been because it's such a big disco sample rip, I don't know if it would have had long legs to, to float in the mainstream. But as always, this is all subjective. Some people don't like one because they weren't ready for such a smooth, soft song with Eric Rodgers singing all over it. Uh, some people feel like the Anthony Hamilton dramatic singing on the things we'd be doing for money was overkill. So these are all things to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats. Takes us to dimension eight, Mass Appeal. All right, Buster is not a stranger to commercial success. Not only has he had it prior to this album as a guest rapper, he had it with his group, Leaders of the New School. He had it with his first LP. And now this is him just trying to repeat the success. On this album, he hits the height of his commercial darling period, where he is infallible in what I've termed the Diddy era. Remember 1997 is the bad boy year. Busta Rhymes decidedly leaned more to that side, so much so that he became one of the main acts on the Puff Daddy and Friends tour. And that's off the strength of the success of the song, Put Your Hands Where My Eyes Can See, which came through like a whirlwind to the hip hop world when it really needed resuscitation because it was reeling from two major deaths. And he brings this song and it starts getting played ad nauseum by all of the New York DJs till it spread across the country. This is one of those songs that knew no coast in the middle of everybody drawing lines and picking sides. Buster Rhymes transcended all of that with this song that just made everybody want to get up. And if they weren't dancing, they were definitely reciting the lyrics or trying to learn them because he introduced so much newness with this song. So it was a breath of fresh air and only followed and bolstered by what he did with the two singles that made it a solidified success. So we're talking about Dangerous, where he hit new ground where everybody was sampling from the 80s. He sampled an unconventional 80s song that still made you want to get up and dance and rock. I don't think it lived as long in the mainstream as Put Your Hands Where My Eyes Could See, but what you want your second and third singles to do it, are either confirm and solidify what the first single did or take it to the next level. And what his second and third singles did was kind of keep it all in the success basket. And so the third single being Turn It Up and what most mainstream outlets got was the Night Rider version of that song. And if we're talking about these things, we cannot talk about Busta Rhymes, Mass Appeal and mainstream success without talking about his videos. 
the videos are what created the word of mouth conversation on top of the quality of these singles being selected. Shout out to Busta and his executive producer because they chose the right songs off an album where they could have chosen from a bevy of songs because a lot of these tracks had what was the mainstream formula at the time and could have worked, but not as great as these three songs. And so you have the video for Put Your Hands Where My Eyes Can See, which has this coming to America inspired theme, which I don't think was very obvious to everybody at first, uh, because he also incorporates elements of Jamaican broke up style dancing, which had become super popular at that point. And that's what you see when you see the guys moving around with the neon glow paint on them. In, in this really creepy but beautiful fashion, right? And then Busta Rhymes doing things like marching with the elephants, this giving it his own life. It just seemed like a continuation of the Wuha video, just a little darker. Then you got Dangerous, where we got into the era of MTV's making the video. And you got to see Busta Rhymes take you behind the scenes where he says, I'm gonna turn into a white guy. And at that point, we had never seen someone black put on face paint to become a white character besides Eddie Murphy doing that in the Coming to America movie as the Jewish guy in the barbershop. And so this is a rapper saying, I'm gonna do white face. He had the blonde wig. He winds up looking like an albino running through the streets in the Dangerous video. But Dangerous video being another nod to something from the 80s and another video that gets talked about and brings the single that much more life. The third installment being the Knight Rider version of Turn It Up, where he plays off Knight Rider and Mad Max and gives you this black and white cinematic video. And it all goes in line with what everybody who was a major artist was doing in that day, getting into the big budget video aesthetic and Buster never disappointed. This is how he built his reputation of being the video king the rap hip hop video king before Missy came and became the rap video queen and Luda came in the 2000s and challenged Busta for that spot for most creative, animated, talked about videos. All these things add to the formula, contributed to Busta Rhymes, having this album become a certified platinum hit, which was a big deal in the 90s. Again, he was a part of that Bad Boy tour. It was a very winning year for Busta Rhymes. So a platinum album, with tracks that had backups. The backup singles on this album could have been Get High Tonight, could have been Ain't a Problem My Squad Can't Fix, could have been One, could have been Body Rock. He had tracks. And if he wanted to do a video for We Could Take It Outside, because he was busted, and because of the buildup from all the other songs being so popular and successful, he could have gotten away with that. And the visuals would have made up for the commercial appeal of a song that's so dark with no hook because you're getting so many characters you're being introduced to. Rod Digger's presence alone would have been like, oh. So, something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats. That takes us to Dimension Nine. My favorite, the three eyes, impact, innovation, influence. All right, impact. I mentioned how big of a movement the lead off single put your hands on my eyes could see was this is a game changing song not only for Busta but for hip hop itself in the year 1997 it is a song that gets played to this day it's a song that if you ask most people to tell you what their favorite videos of all time were will wind up on the list and it is a song that introduced a new pattern to hip hop it was a different kind of sampling we hadn't heard a song like this introduced at least not in 90s hip hop where it's this kind of stripped down percussive beat that allowed you to just really pay attention to the rapper's flow and what Busta Rhymes did was introduced us to a flow that we didn't hear hit you with no delay so what you saying yo it riding the drum pattern perfectly uh he also introduced us to a new phrase in hip hop. This song was bigger than the album. You'll see interviews or read interviews where Busta talks about the making of that song in particular, and you realize that they were seeing that they had a monster on their hand as it grew. Because of that, an album titled When Disaster Strikes, even though all of Busta's albums have this event theme, this 90s era was the time where all of his releases, he was able to match the feeling of the anticipation of the album with the title. And uh, 
Yeah, that's that's the impact. Innovation, I mentioned, the flow and production that was being brought to the game with that dangerous letting producers know that yes, you can sample from this kind of music again, because this was a throwback to the way hip hop started with some of that futuristic disco, dance, electronica feel. And also what he did with that video, bringing that white face element into it and having these 80s throwback homages these big budget videos. This is all a part of the packaging of this album. And and then I'll mention also that Buster also doubled down on something that he had been doing for a while, which is the sing-songiness. On the title track, he just flat out sings. The hook is tra la 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 sha la 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 sha la 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 like he's just showcasing his version of creativity and that's what you're getting all throughout this album of freeness and how that influenced the game. We think of Busta as being a one of one, but you can hear his influence in other rappers. When I think of a bot 10, there's things that Busta does with his cadence and his enunciation and syllable structure, where you can definitely hear slum village in this. In an era where rappers really prided themselves on three verses and labels are still telling their rappers to have three verse songs with clear hooks for radio play. Busta was like, nah, all you need is this and enough to dance or nod your head to. Busta was all about the head nod. And so you're getting two verse tracks, you're getting the introduction of what singles like Dangerous, you put your hands on my eyes, can see did. You're getting the video element, you're getting the sing songiness and just the free expression that's going on in this album. Something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats when you're considering the impact innovation and influence takes us to the final dimension dimension 10 the overall timelessness or uniqueness of this album so of course with statements like with phrases littered around the album like word is bond it can have a dated quality but there's nothing production wise here that really makes it sound dated for the big sampled songs they're already using the cheat code if you like the things that these songs are sampled from already then that's 50% of the battle right there. The Knight Rider remix to turn it up. Ironically, Timbaland had used the same sample and the Busta Rhymes song just outperformed it. So much so that it wound up on repackage and future versions of the album. And, you know, just picking the right elements. So picking that Sills and Cross song for Put Your Hands On My Eyes Can See, timeless. Dangerous might have a dated quality because it sounded like what a lot of producers started doing from that point on that this album introduced. Cool. But then the undeniable boom bap that DJ Scratch provided creates timeless hip hop. I've heard people say that We Can Take It Outside is one of the greatest hip hop beats. And of course, now Jay Dilla's contributions on this album are highly honored and, and coveted throughout hip hop. So, production wise, you're getting more timelessness than not. Rhyme-wise, this is where it gets tricky because Buster Rhymes' lyrics tend to be very forgettable, but his songs and their impact are unforgettable. So where do you make your decision there? And all of that is besides the fact that Buster Rhymes says 1997 all over this album. For some reason, that's something Buster loves doing, saying the year on the song. He clearly didn't get that same memo that Q-Tip got from Lars Professor telling him not to say the year on the record to avoid it sounding dated and to kill its timelessness factor. Uh, there's not very many people I know who go around quoting Buster Rhymes, but we'll talk more about that in the next category. For now, when you're thinking about the timelessness and overall uniqueness, we know this is something that sounded like nothing else at the time. As we go back in hip hop history, is there anything else that sounds quite like when disaster strikes? Something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats. And with that, we conclude our category one review of the classic album, When Disaster Strikes by Busta Rhymes. Join us when we go over category two, the rap performance on this album. That'll be the next episode. In the meantime, shout out to my nephew on the beat. Not that nephew. And until then, y'all know what it is. F a rap critic. They talk about it while I live it. Word to meth.